Okay, so those are some reflex considerations with regard to radiculopathy, and it gives us some indication as to what normal reflexes mean. It means that there is a lot of structures that have to be functioning properly in order to produce normal and brisk reflexes. Well, what kind of uh, reflex signs and what kind of physical exam signs would you expect to find uh, in the case of cervical myelopathy? Okay, so let's turn our attention now to uh, cortical spinal involvement or injury to the spinal cord. And let's think for a minute, what kind of reflex findings uh, would we find and what kind of physical exam findings uh, would we expect to see in an injured worker uh, presenting with myelopathy? Well, we already talked about several, several uh, different uh, findings that we would expect on an activities of daily living assessment. But when it comes to the physical exam, we're going to focus our attention on reflex findings and exam findings. And the reflex signs would include, number one, hyperreflexia. In other words, reflexes grading at the three and four uh, level. And then also, we would find the presence of pathologic reflexes. And the AMA guides uh, specifically referred to the Babinski sign. So here shortly we'll talk about the Babinski reflex, also known as the plantar reflex. Uh, we'll also talk about some of the other pathologic reflexes that really are just derivations or uh, modifications of the Babinski reflex, such as the Hoffman reflex and the Gonda reflex and, and others. And we'll get into those here shortly. And then on physical exam, we would expect to find... Uh, uh, any combination of the following findings, uh, we would expect to find uh, myelopathic gait. And uh, we'll talk about what a myelopathic gait consists of here. Uh, we may or may not see a positive Lermit sign, and we may or may not see uh, a positive Sperling sign. So let's talk uh, more now about uh, cortical spinal uh, tract injury and get into some of these uh, physical examination uh, maneuvers. So by way of review, for those of you that have the PowerPoint presentation, I have a slide here uh, that I've uh, put in here just to refresh your memory on uh, some of the ascending and descending tracks uh, of the spinal cord. And this is a cross-section of the spinal cord uh, high up into the cervical spine. And we're going to focus our attention here on the anterior and lateral cortical spinal tracts because those are the tracts that are specifically mentioned uh, in the AMA guides. And the anterior and lateral cortical spinal tract uh, comprise what is known as the pyramidal tracts. Uh, and there are other descending motor tracts uh, indicated here in this diagram. Uh, that also contribute to motor function and motor coordination uh, that are not considered part of the pyramidal tract. They're considered uh, extra pyramidal. And we'll talk about the functions of the rubrospinal tract and the reticulospinal tract and these other tracts here uh, in just a minute. Now, the AMA guides, in referring to uh, spinal cord injury, define and describe that as a cortical spinal tract injury, but we know that an injury to the spinal cord can affect any uh, of these descending motor pathways. So let's talk about uh, the functions of these motor pathways, and that'll give us some understanding as to the different types of motor findings uh, that we can encounter on our physical examination. So the cortical spinal tracts uh, uh, are found uh, in the pyramidal tracts composed of the anterior cortical spinal tract and the lateral uh, cortical spinal tract. And if we were talking about uh, higher up into the brainstem, uh, the, cor the uh, pyramidal tracts would also include the motor tracts to the cranial nerves, the so-called cortical bulbar tracts. But here we're down in the cervical spine, so the cortical bulbar tracts have now uh, tapered out and tapered off, and we're left with the anterior cortical and lateral cortical spinal tracts. Now, the anterior cortical spinal tract is involved with motor activity of the upper extremities down to about 
uh, T6. So that indicates that it that it's involved mostly in upper extremity uh, and cervical spine uh, movements and motor functions. So the anterior cortical spinal tract uh, controls central axial uh, and girdle muscles, such as the muscles that control uh, the shoulder girdle, for example. The lateral cortical spinal tract is involved with fine movement uh, of the limbs of both the upper and the lower extremities. Anterior cortical spinal tract not involved with uh, the lower extremities. Those functions are assumed by the lateral cortical spinal tract. So those are the pyramidal tracts. And then we have uh, at least four extra pyramidal tracts. We have the reticulospinal tract. And the reticulospinal tract uh, has neurons that originate in the reticular formation, which is in the medullary pontine area of the brainstem. And the reticulospinal tract is involved with locomotion uh, and postural control of the trunk and the proximal limbs. Proximal limbs, so elbows to shoulders, knees to hips. We have also the tectospinal tract, which uh, originates from the dor dorsal part of the mesencephalon, uh, also known as the midbrain, and is composed primarily of the superior and inferior colliculi, and so therefore it's involved with coordinating head, neck, and eye movements, primarily as those movements uh, correspond and respond to visual stimuli coordinates head, neck, and eye movements primarily in response to visual stimuli. The rubrospinal tracts originate in the rostral midbrain red nucleus, and the rubrospinal tract is responsible for large muscle movement as well as fine motor control, uh, terminating primarily in the cervical spinal cord, suggesting that it functions like the anterior cortical spinal tract primarily uh, in the upper limb. So an injury to the cervical spine, spinal cord, uh, could injure the rubrospinal tract, uh, disrupting functions uh, in the upper limbs. Finally, uh, the vestibulospinal tract originates in the vestibular nuclei in the pons and medulla, and this is the nucleus that receives uh, inputs from cranial nerve number 8 specifically the vestibular portion of cranial nerve number 8, uh, accumulating sensory input from the vestibular apparatus. And the vestibulospinal tract is involved with changing the position of the body uh, and the limbs to maintain posture of the body in alignment with the head as vestibular information is accumulated due to movements of the head relative uh, to the gravitational pull of the Earth. So we have all these tracks. We have the pyramidal tracks and the extra pyramidal tracks. And any one or multiples of these tracks can be injured with injury to the spinal cord, not just the uh, cortical spinal tracts. And I mention this here to you just to refresh your memory about spinal cord injury. Now, the AMA guides refer, refer specifically to the cortical spinal tracts. But we now know that any of these tracks can disrupt, uh, can be injured, and can uh, disrupt motor control uh, in parts distal to the level of the lesion. So, with injury to the uh, cortical spinal tracts and these other tracts, uh, what we're going to see on physical exam is injury here shows up quite quite prominently. Uh, in altered and abnormal reflexes. So let's talk about some of these uh, reflexes that we can test in our physical exam that would suggest uh, in, in possible permanent impairment uh, due to uh, cortical spinal tract injury. Now I refer you to your AMA guides uh, box 15.1 where the Babinski sign is specifically referred to in the AMA guides and it says quote Abnormal reflexes such as Babinski signs or clonus may be signs of cortical spinal tract involvement. So let's talk about uh, the Babinski and other signs. 
The Babinski reflex is also known as the plantar reflex, and you can search for this reflex with use of either of those terms. Now, unlike deep tendon and muscle stretch reflexes, the Babinski reflex is a skin, uh, a skin reflex, or it's a superficial reflex, not a deep reflex. It's a superficial skin reflex. Now, we have examples of other superficial reflexes that we test throughout the body, such as the corneal reflex, such as the gag reflex, such as the abdominal skin and muscle reflexes, uh, the anal wink and the bulbo, bulbo cavernosis reflexes. Those are all skin, uh, superficial skin reflexes. Now, in researching the plantar reflex, uh, I came across a quote by De Meyer uh, in his text, textbook, The Technique of the Neurologic Exam, 5th edition. He said, the most important of all reflexes to test is the plantar reflex. So in order to test the plantar reflex, we have our examinee supine with the limbs completely relaxed and the examiner strokes the lateral side of the sole of the foot. Let me repeat that, the lateral side of the sole of the foot. So I want you to picture this in your mind. You're facing your examinee, uh, you're facing the sole of their feet. You're going to stroke the lateral side of the sole of the foot from the medial calcaneal tubercle to the head of the third metatarsal. Do not strike the toes, okay? So in other words, we begin at the calcaneus and trace a path along the lateral side of the sole of the foot all the way up to uh, the head of the third metatarsal, making certain not to stroke the toes, which would stimulate other uh, sensory receptors uninvolved with the plantar reflex. Now the length the velocity and the pressure of the stroke uh, are important and you want to apply enough pressure you want to apply enough pressure to stimulate the uh, sensory receptors the Meisner's corpuscles uh, Ruffini endings uh, Merkel's discs and you want to you want to stimulate these superficial sensory receptors but you don't want to apply it too much pressure so much pressure that you stimulate the deep pain receptors because then that would stimulate a different type of reflex known as the flexor withdrawal response. So the length of your stroke is important and I've given you the parameters. It goes from the medial calcaneal tubercle to the head of the third metatarsal. The velocity is important and the pressure of the stroke are important. Now in a normal uninjured examinee, the large toe will plantar flex. In other words, the large toe will be down going. And you will sometimes see that phrase uh, described in medical reports. You'll say the flexor, uh, the plantar reflex was toes down going. Toes down going. Now, in my opinion, that's not an adequate description because the reader of the report has no idea what toes down going means. Okay, and I'll give you some suggestion as to how to uh, report your findings. So the normal response is toes down going, plantar flexion of the large toe. Now in the case of cortical spinal tract damage, uh, in other words, an injury to the upper motor neurons, we're going to see what's called a positive Babinski sign. And in a positive Babinski sign, the large toe extends at the metatarsal phalangeal joint. So an abnormal finding, in other words, a positive Babinski sign, is big toe extension. A normal finding is big toe plantar flexion. Now when the big toe extends due to injury to the cortical spinal tract, we call that a positive Babinski sign. There is no such thing as a negative Babinski sign. So make sure not to report in your uh, report of findings that there was a negative Babinski sign. Only the presence of a Babinski sign is a positive finding. So 
the presence of a positive Babinski sign should be a repeatable uh, occurrence and a repeatable observation. So if your pressure, if your stroke, if your velocity and the length of your stroke are all correct and you do get a positive Babinski sign, that positive Babinski sign should be repeatable. If indeed it is repeatable, that's a positive finding for cortical spinal tract and upper motor neuron uh, lesion. Now let's uh, let's discuss the Babinski reflex. How does it work? Well, the reflexogenous zone for the plantar reflex is the S1 dermatome, which is the lateral aspect. Uh, of the sole of the foot. That's why it's important to stay on the lateral aspect of the sole of the foot and not migrate to the medial aspect which is the L5 uh, dermatome. Now the afferent impulses uh, for these receptors on the lateral aspect of the sole of the foot travel in the tibial nerve. So the afferent nerve is the tibial nerve and then the tibial nerve runs up towards the spinal cord and uh, sends axons into the L4, L5, S1, and S2 uh, levels of the spinal cord. And this might be an important uh, junction to make a couple of comments about the conus medullaris of the spinal cord. Recall that the lumbar spinal cord ends at approximately the L1 spinal level, the L1 vertebral level. And so at, at around the T12, T11, T12, L1 level of the spinal cord, there's tremendous uh, compaction of neurons. It's called the lumbar enlargement. And all the lumbar and all the sacral spinal cord levels are contained in this small section uh, of this distal end of the spinal cord which we call the terminal cone or the conus medullaris. So these afferent nerves that travel in the tibial nerve uh, send axons into this small compacted area uh, at the L4, L5, S1, and S2 levels of the spinal cord and that might sound like a broad distribution but actually understand that it's a very, very tightly and small compacted area uh, of the spinal cord that is receiving these afferent impulses. Okay, so once the afferent impulses come into these levels of the spinal cord, the efferent response, uh, the motor response, travels back again through the L4, L5, S1, and S2 roots uh, in the sciatic nerve all the way down to its bifurcation down back behind the knee where it bifurcates into the tibial nerve uh, and the per, uh, deep peroneal nerve. Now the toe flexors in the case of a normal response we get toe plantar toe flexion correct toes down going. Now the toe flexors are innervated by the tibial nerve the toe extensors such as the extensor hallucis longus and the extensor digitorum longus are innervated by the deep peroneal nerve. Okay, so different innervations and we see different responses uh, depending upon whether there is cortical spinal tract injury or not. Now loss of the normal adult descending pyramidal control of the reflex arc which suppresses the extensor withdrawal response results in the upgoing toes in the plantar reflex. This is known as the positive Babinski sign. And it's the cortical spinal tracts, the upper motor neuron lesions, that would suppress the extensor withdrawal response when uh, a noxious stimulus is applied to the sole of the foot and that's the purpose of applying a stroke to the bottom of the foot. It's simply a noxious stimulus that stimulates the sensory receptors in the S1 uh, region of the sole of the foot and in the normal situation the upper motor neurons suppress the extensor withdrawal uh, response. 
However, when we have cortical spinal tract and upper motor neuron injury, we have a loss of this uh, descending inhibition of the extensor response, and we get a bona fide extensor response where the great toe extends, and this is what we call a positive Babinski sign. So the extensor toe response is simply a sign of anatomic or pathophysiologic interruption uh, of the pyramidal or cortical spinal tracts. It basically means that we have an upper motor neuron lesion. And we have other reflexes uh, that you've heard about and that we can test to confirm our findings. And really, they're just different stimuli within the S1 dermatome that also result in an extensor response in the case of an upper motor neuron lesion. So for example, other maneuvers that you can add to your examination template for cortical spinal tract injury uh, would include Chaddox sign. With Chaddox sign, you simply stroke the lateral malleolus. See, rather than stroking the lateral aspect of the sole of the foot, here we stro stro stroke uh, the lateral malleolus, also within the S1 uh, dermatome. And in the presence of a, an upper motor neuron lesion, uh, stroking the lateral malleus, malleolus results in an extensor response of the great toe, similar to a positive Babinski sign. Uh, with the Schaefer sign, we get an extensor toe response with squeezing the Achilles tendon. Uh, with the Oppenheim sign, uh, we get an extensor toe response with applying pressure to the medial side of the tibia. With a Gordon sign, we get an extensor toe response with squeezing of the calf muscle. And with a Gonda sign, we get an extensor toe response with flexing and suddenly releasing the fourth toe. So these are all confirmatory maneuvers uh, to confirm the presence or absence of a positive Babinski sign. Now in the upper extremities uh, there are some reflexes that we can test. The most uh, famous or the most renowned of which is the Hoffman reflex. Now with the Hoffman reflex the examiner depresses the distal phalanx typically of the middle finger to, to leave the thumb and the index finger free. So the examiner stabilizes the uh, metacarpal first uh, the, the metacarpal phalangeal joint of the third digit and then with the other hand uh, depresses the distal phalanx of the middle finger and allows it to flip up. And what happens is the extension of the phalanx stretches the flexor muscles on the flexor uh, surface of the finger. And this causes the fingers and the thumb to flex. And this is a pathologic uh, reflex. What you'll see clinically is you'll see a flexion uh, toward each other of the index finger and the thumb as you allow the distal phalanx of the middle finger uh, to flip up. So those are some of the pathologic reflexes associated with cortical spinal tract injury. How would our deep tendon reflexes uh, appear in the case of cortical spinal tract injury? Well, with cortical spinal tract injury, what we're going to find uh, is we're going to find hyperreflexia or hyperactive uh, reflexes, reflexes that grade uh, in the three or four uh, level of the grading scale. Now there are many causes of hyperreflexia. It may simply be physiologic. In other words, uh, a a active reflexes may simply be the upper range of normal for this particular examinee. And one way to determine that is to make sure to test bilaterally and then also uh, compare upper and lower extremity uh, reflexes for symmetry. Now uh, hyperreflexia may also, also be pathologic. For example, may be due to some sort of a structural uh, lesion in the central nervous system, such as malformation, 
such as birth injury uh, or cerebral palsy, uh, could be due to a vascular injury, a neoplastic injury, uh, could simply be the result of degenerative change of the uh, central nervous system. In our case, in, in the case of examining injured workers, most likely and most commonly we'll be dealing with traumatic injuries uh, to, to the central nervous system. May also be to, due to some type of toxic or metabolic disorder, uh, such as hypocalcemia uh, or even strychnine poisoning. Now, the most extreme form uh, of hyperreflexia uh, is what's known as clonus. Now, clonus is derived from the Greek word, which means violent and confused motion. And what clonus is, is clonus is a series of involuntary rhythmic muscular contractions followed by relaxations. So it's rhythmic contractions and relaxations that are involuntary. And it's associated with upper motor neuron lesion involving descending motor pathways. And in many cases, clonus will be accompanied by spasticity. And spasticity is really just another form uh, of hyperexcitability uh, of the lower motor neuron lesion due to lack of inhibition uh, from the upper motor neuron. Now, clonus causes large motions, large sways of motions, large oscillations. And it's usually initiated by a reflex, such as tapping the Achilles tendon or tapping the patellar tendon or initiating a quick stretch in, in one of the muscle groups. And studies have shown that clonus beat Beat frequencies range from somewhere between three to eight cycles per second on average. So it's sort of a rapid oscillation. And the oscillations may last uh, from a few seconds to several minutes depending upon the examinee's condition. So how do you test clonus? Well, typically clonus is tested at the ankle most commonly. And clonus is tested by rapidly flexing the foot upward into dorsiflexion. And what that does is that induces a rapid stretch to the gastrocnemius muscle. Now, it's important that once you initiate the rapid stretch of the gastrocnemius muscle that you maintain or sustain pressure on the sole of the foot in the direction of dorsiflexion. And what this does is it reinitiates the stretch once the contraction, the reflexive contraction, has subsided. So the rapid stretch of the foot into dorsiflexion, that rapidly stretches the gastrocnemius muscle, that initiates a stretch reflex to shorten the gastrocnemius muscle. And then after that shortening contraction subsides, your sustained pressure on the sole of the foot drives that ankle again back into dorsiflexion, which then initiates a reflexive plantar flexion, and the cycle continues. And so you'll see subsequent beating of the foot uh, that is sustained. Now, a sustained clonus of five beats per more is considered abnormal and sign of cortical spinal tract injury less than five sustained beats may it may be physiologic it may be at the upper range of normal for this particular uh, examinee and that's your determination that you'll you'll make doctor that's your determination to make as to whether or not this constitutes a normal versus an abnormal finding now clonus is typically tested at the ankle it can also be tested in other parts of the body. For example, it can be tested at the elbow by initiating a rapid stretch of the biceps muscle. It can be tested at the wrist by initiating a quick extension uh, of the wrist, thereby stretching the wrist flexors. Uh, it can also be tested at the knees by rapidly pushing the patella towards the toes. And for those of you that have the PowerPoint presentation, I've included here a, a link to a video demonstration of ankle clonus. 
and you'll see that the clonus is initiated exactly in the manner that we've described here and the rapid oscillations of the foot into plantar and dorsiflexion continues for more than five beats so that's considered a positive finding for cortical spinal tract injury now in addition to reflex findings uh, both pathologic reflexes uh, hyperreflexia and possibly even clonus there are a couple of physical examination maneuvers that you're going to want to add to your template uh, to examine for the presence or absence of cortical spinal tract injury and specifically uh, the layer mitt sign involves a sharp flexion of the head and cervical spine and this stretches the neural tissue at the site of the spinal cord lesion and in the in the uh, presence of a significant lesion uh, the examinee may report an electric shock like sensation or pins and needles sensation into uh, the extremities or anywhere throughout the body and this uh, exam maneuver can be exacerb further exacerbated by uh, increasing intraspinal pressure through the valsalva maneuver such as with coughing sneezing or even straining and so this is not pathognomonic of cortical spinal tract injury but in the presence of electric shock like sensations or pins and needles that pass throughout the body this is strongly suggestive uh, of cortical spinal tract injury well what about gait findings uh, with uh, myelopathy and cortical spinal tract injury we have both uh, findings in the upper extremities and the lower extremities and typically upper uh, upper motor neuron lesion cortical spinal tract injury causes uh, weakness and loss of coordination in the lower extremities and so this will be clearly observable in the case of a bona fide uh, cortical spinal tract injury. Your examinee uh, will demonstrate the so-called myelopathic gait. Now myelopathic gait is defined as an ataxic broad-based shuffling gait due to sensory changes in the lower extremities. Now ataxia is lack of muscular coordination due to muscular weakness. So these uh, examinees have gait disturbance due to both sensory and motor changes. Now, you may or may not uh, have ever experienced an ataxic uh, gait yourself, but I'm certain that you have uh, experienced a broad-based gait due to lack of uh, sensory input. And I can give you an example as to how you've experienced a broad-based gait. In fact, you might want to try this uh, uh, tonight. If you've ever uh, gotten up in the middle of the night, perhaps to use the restroom, and the room is dark, and uh, you're not uh, afforded the opportunity of normal visual input to tell your brain uh, your relative position in space and relative to walls and external objects, uh, almost reflexively, you will broaden your base of support and walk with a broad base gait in order to prevent yourself from losing balance and falling over and similarly with cortical spinal tract injury uh, examinees are going to have loss of normal ascending sensory input from both the skin muscles and joint receptors in the lower extremities and this causes them to reflexively uh, open up their gait into a broad-based uh, shuffling gait. And so you will readily observe this, uh, both in observation and with their description uh, of their impairment due to activities of daily living. And on physical exam, you can confirm this finding simply by asking them to narrow their base of support by asking them to perform the tandem gait uh, maneuver. And you'll find that they uh, will be unable to perform the tandem gait maneuver. 